Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. This is certainly not the typical audience that I speak to with respect to tuberculosis. I, I focus on hepatitis C. In fact, the closest I came to TB was I did work with Dick Chason as a fellow in 1995 at Johns Hopkins, and then I went into hepatitis C. Now, the reason for that was largely uh, because this was a real opportunity, and I'll take you through some of the history. In 1995, hepatitis C treatment was abysmal, and the prospect for new therapies when I first spoke to my mentor about hepatitis C really did not look like a very good field to get into because we were not making progress, there was no animal model, and we were stuck with interferon alpha given for up to one year with success rates of 6%. Nonetheless, I took that career leap, and here we are 20 years later with highly effective therapies. Now, this is a different pathogen for sure and a different disease, and I'll, I'll highlight some of that, but there may be some areas of unique uh, history that may have some benefit. So I've entitled this Bench to Bedside and Beyond, and these are my disclosures. I worked very closely in hepatitis C drug development, although 80% of my funding comes from the NIH. So this is a story of successful translational research. One of the things I've done is taken a slide of the clinical and translational research paradigm, and what we've done in the world of hepatitis C is gone from the discovery of the pathogen in 1989 to early human trials, which really didn't occur until about 10 to 15 years ago, then into phase two trials. Now, one point about hepatitis C is the phase three trials have mirrored precisely what was seen in phase two. There's been really no drop off in the anticipated outcomes. And then we've jumped into this, what is called T3, translation to populations. And the other important piece is that thus far, these regimens have performed just as well in clinical practices like ours at Johns Hopkins as they did in phase three trials. And then lastly, type four, I'll talk briefly about this, but there are plans underway to eliminate and control hepatitis C in Australia, Iceland, Georgia, not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia. People are already looking at the <laughs> prospects of elimination. So this is a virus, it's a flavivirus, is a positive strand RNA. One of the key features of this particular pathogen is it has an incredible replication rate of 10 to the 12 virions produced. So when one looks at how this virus survives, it does not have a latent phase. It never integrates into host DNA. It enters the hepatocyte. It establishes a factory of viral production with a tremendous output, although each hepatocyte only produces about 10 virions per cell, at least 30 to 40 percent of the liver is thought to be infected. The other key feature is mutations. So mutations develop quite frequently, and modeling suggests that every possible mutation in this viral genome are produced every day in every patient. This leads to diversity within a patient, so you have a quasi-species of closely related virions, and then a distribution across the, the world of genotypes. And this has been a major challenge, <clears throat> the fact that there is so much diversity and such a propensity to develop resistance with this rapid replication. So in a sense, this virus doesn't survive by establishing <laughs> latency, it survives by outrunning the immune system, but as we'll talk about, occasionally the immune system actually can catch this virus and eliminate it. Now, the other point that I make on this slide is that human beings are really the natural host of this pathogen. The lack of an animal model is a, was a major factor in drug development. Chimpanzees represent the only other animal that can be infected, and that is certainly not a natural hepatitis C infection. So this has been a major challenge, but one that was overcome, and I'll talk about how it was overcome. The other problem was that this pathogen wasn't really identified until 1989, and I've taken uh, the, uh, the abstract from the science article by Michael Houghton's group at Chiron, where they used very early cDNA clonal techniques to identify the pathogen. It was really the first time a pathogen was identified using molecular techniques as opposed to a culture, and they found that the cause of non-A, non-B hepatitis was indeed hepatitis C. Antibody testing then followed, 
And it appears that more than 90 to 95 percent of cases that were identified as non-A, non-B, largely in transfusion cohorts, were in fact hepatitis C. So this is the diversity that was then quickly recognized. This was actually taken from a recent uh, clinical trial program that tried to develop a drug regimen that would work on every genotype. And what this highlights is genotype 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. There's actually a 7, but very uncommon. Genotype 1 represents the dominant genotype globally, 65% of patients in the U.S., and about 50% globally have genotype 1 infection. There are important subtypes 1A and 1B. Genotype 3, which you can see is not that closely related to genotype 1, over to the lower right of this slide, that also represents a major challenge. And as we'll talk about, some of the drugs that were developed did not work very well against this pathogen. Genotype 4 bears some mentioning. Genotype 4 is found predominantly in the Middle East, particularly in North Africa, in Egypt. In Egypt, there's an estimated 10 to 20 million Egyptians infected with genotype 4, in part spread through a government campaign to eradicate schistosomiasis. That campaign did not work to eliminate that particular pathogen, but it did spread hepatitis C to literally millions of Egyptians. And underway today is an effort to try to control that disease in the Egyptian population, but there's a tremendous burden. This highlights both the diversity and propensity of hepatitis C around the world. Estimates are 150 million people and about 500,000 deaths per year. You can see a burden of genotype 3, particularly in Southeast Asia, very high prevalence of disease in places like India and China, genotype 4 in North Africa, and then in the U.S. you see more genotype 1 uh, as the predominant. This is a slide taken from the Global Burden of Disease study in uh, 2012, and people in viral hepatitis field uh, show this frequently because when you combine hepatitis B deaths with hepatitis C deaths, the numbers actually mirror those of HIV. Now, that's not to say that there's these other disease states are not important, clearly you see TB on this slide, but it does represent the burden of viral hepatitis C and B. Now, I will admit we had to combine C with B to get up to that level. If you take one pathogen uh, alone, it would be much lower on this slide. And in fact, they are different pathogens entirely. They really only share one thing in common, that's the propensity to infect liver cells. Otherwise, they're quite different. Nonetheless, uh, when you combine them, you see more deaths. Now, in the U.S., hepatitis C deaths have continued to rise. And this slide from the CDC, updated recently at ID Week in 2015, demonstrates that death from hepatitis C actually exceeds that of HIV and has done so since 2007. You can see the good news, HIV deaths continue to fall, but hepatitis C rises in part because of uh, a number of issues. There is also new infections. Hepatitis C is continuing to spread. I won't belabor this point, but for the first time in the last five years, the incidence of hepatitis C in the United States has increased largely through the resurgence of heroin injection drug use. You can see that new cases in 2012 in this slide from CDC are increasing rapidly. That's a whole nother discussion, but hepatitis C is far from being controlled. And in fact, what this slide demonstrates in the care cascade is that most people globally have not been diagnosed. This is a U.S. cascade, but it's estimated that only about 10 percent have been diagnosed, very few linked to care, very few treated. So like many infectious diseases, diagnosis remains actually the main challenge. And this cascade uh, is one of the issues in, that we deal with in trying to deliver treatments. With that, I'll move to talk about treatment. <clears throat> this is where I started with interferon for six months, 6% 6 SVR rate. You can see this slow and steady increase to 2015, where we now see sustained virologic response, or HEV cure, of 95% on average. <laughs> This went from interferon injections Monday, Wednesday, Friday for six months to a year to the addition of ribavirin to the addition of a long-acting interferon and then in 2011 the addition of the very first direct-acting antiviral 
And then you can see quite rapid evolution to the current regiments. So this story goes back to 1986. Non-A, non-B hepatitis. Interferon alpha had been identified and was available recombinantly. Researchers at NIH, including Jay Hufnagel, the lead author of this study in control medicine, gave 10 patients with chronic non-A, non-B hepatitis interferon alpha either thrice weekly or every other day for up to 12 months. Now, what they identified is that these individuals had a normalization of serum LT. There was no way to measure the actual virus. PCR to measure viral load was not yet available. Now, what they did notice is that three of these patients actually had sustained improvement in ALT. Their liver enzymes remained normal, suggesting the disease had been interrupted. The other ones all had viral rebound, where their, in what in hindsight we now know is viral rebound, where their ALT levels came back up. This led in 1992 to the FDA approval of interferon for what was then hepatitis C. But it was based, as we learned, on very low response rates, but it was actually the first drug to be developed. Now, interferon had many problems. Interferon alpha is a, obviously a natural occurring antiviral agent. What we didn't understand but now do is that the human, humans have a very heterogeneous response. What's depicted in the figure is that there was identification of a host polymorphism at interleukin 28b, which is a type 3 interferon. And if you are favorable at that particular polymorphism, interferon worked 80% of the time. However, if you had a T allele at this particular SNP, only 25% had success. So the therapy really only worked for some individuals. This explains an observation in trials that African Americans did not respond well. We now know that the prevalence of the favorable uh, SNP uh, polymorphism is quite uncommon in those with African descent. The other problem with interferon is that everyone got side effects. So you took an asymptomatic disease, one in which people felt fine, you gave them injections of interferon, human beings in general don't like to take in injections, that made them sick for up to 48 weeks. With that, you delivered a cure to about 25%. Many people decided that this therapy was not worth it and decided not to pursue treatment. It also launched an effort to try to find better antiviral drugs. If we could get rid of interferon, which is host-dependent, number one, heterogeneous, number two, and number three, serious side effects, and not particularly effective against genotype one, perhaps we could do better. So the key was understanding the viral life cycle, which is depicted here. This slide taken from Stuart Ray, my colleague at Hopkins in Fields Virology. The virus enters the liver cell, and that's only been recently worked out. It binds to SRB1, the HDL receptor, and a complex pathway, which includes CD81, Claudin, and occludin, enters the cell. There's a translation process, protease cleavage. There's then a membranous web formation which forms a replication complex where you see this NS5B polymerase interacting with a lipoprotein called NS5A to produce uh, virions that are then assembled and released. You'll also see that the host factors are involved, including MIR-122, and currently there is an injectable MIR-122 antisense compound that shows remarkable antiviral effect. There's also cyclophilin inhibitors that have antiviral effects as well. Those were not ultimately pushed forward because they target the host, which is inherently more difficult than targeting the virus. But each of these other steps, with the exception of entry, has been the target of antiviral drugs. This shows that in a different way, you can see the non-structural proteins. There's the NS3 protease, the very first antivirals targeted this particular region. There's the NS5A lipoprotein, which is particularly interesting because it's not an enzyme. It's a, it interacts with NS5B as well as other viral factors and host factors, including cyclophilin, but it does not have enzymatic activity. And then there's the polymerase that copies the single-stranded <coughs> RNA. That's the NS5B region. And you can see this depicted in a cartoon format below. But these targets were readily identified. In fact, as far back as 1996, the 
crystal structures of the protease, the helicase, the primlase have been identified. This is a snapshot of the protease. People focused on this because HIV protease inhibitors, things like indinavir, had already been launched. It was clear that if you targeted a rapidly producing virus at the protease, you could see benefits in terms of antiviral effect. And now you had the crystal structure. It had a relatively shallow binding point, but that wasn't the biggest challenge to finding drugs. The biggest challenge was in 1996, there was no particular way to study protease inhibitors. How could you test drugs without an animal model or an in vitro model? The chimpanzee was really the only non-human animal to be susceptible. But you can't really screen molecules as antiviral drugs in a chimpanzee model. There was the bovine viral di diarrhea virus model, which is a similar, but really not that similar virus that people tried to use to screen drugs. It really came in 1999 with the development of the subgenomic replicon. This was the major driver of drug discovery. This gave for the very first time the ability to target protease, polymerase, and NS5A in an in vitro model and identify through large screening of libraries drugs that worked. Uh, several years later, there was actually a strain, a genotype 2 strain from a patient in Japan, a very virulent, aggressive strain. The patient actually succumbed, which is quite unusual, that led to a complete replication uh, model that one could then study entry and understand a little bit more how these pathogens worked. So this was the identification of the subgenomic replicon by Bartenschlager's group published in Science. What they essentially did was took <clears throat> the non-structural proteins from the hepatitis C, placed them into this uh, construct, this subgenomic replicon. They took the 5' prime non-translated region. They took a gene encoding uh, marker. They took an IRES, an internal ribosome entry site from another virus that then allowed the translation of these proteins. And put this into a cell model, there were adaptations of this model that enhanced replication. So it is important to note this isn't a full replication cycle, and the virus that develops in the subject replicon is not quite the same virus. But for the very first time, you could take a library of putative protease inhibitors and put them and rapidly assess their antiviral activity in vitro. Now the question is, would that translate? The very first hepatitis C drug to really be assessed was a drug from Behringer Engelheim 2061. Now, in the test tube, in the in vitro model, this provided very potent antiviral activity. But what is depicted here, over to the left, is when it was given to patients. And this is perhaps a major advantage in hepatitis C. Three days of dosing, an oral drug taken once daily, you can see a three to four log decline in viral replication within three days, just this rapid decline. That obviously represents an antiviral drug. In fact, I can remember meeting with the uh, uh, committee member of the IRB at Hopkins where we proposed a one-day study to select doses of a protease inhibitor. And the IRB member said to me, you will never see antiviral activity in one day. That's too soon. Why are you doing a one-day study? But in fact, if you look at one day, 24 hours, you can see that you could easily know this was an antiviral drug with just 24 hours of human dosing. The first models that were done in the upper right with a drug called telapavir, the BIL-on 2061 drug actually caused cardiotoxicity in a monkey model after 24 weeks and was not developed. But telapavir emerged as a protease inhibitor, the first to be approved around the world in 2011. They gave monotherapy 14 days. And what this slide depicts is if you give a rapidly replicating virus monotherapy with the mutation rate that I mentioned earlier, you'll see a resistance emerge. And that's exactly what happened. Now, this 14-day dosing study had a major impact on future development. That led the FDA to say, you know what, we need to limit monotherapy to only three days. There'll be no more 14-day dosing trials of monotherapy, only three days. We don't want to see resistance emerge. It also led to a very cautious approach. Telapavir was developed with interferon 
and ribavirin as its backbone. So the patient, when this drug was ultimately developed, took interferon shots once weekly. They took telapavir every eight hours with 20 grams of fat to enhance absorption, and they took ribavirin twice a day. It was roughly 15 pills a day plus shots. It had a tremendous safety profile that led to discontinuation in a large number of patients and serious toxicity. Now, would you want to have to develop these drugs with interferon? No, but at the time, interferon and ribavirin were the only approved backbones, and because of the problem with resistance, there was an assistance to develop these with the existing therapy. Now, that paradigm add on to existing therapy led to major delays in development because you had to take your single drug, add it to interferon ribavirin, and that really slowed things down. Another important strategy that emerged was replication suppression by NS5A inhibitors. These don't project all that well, I apologize for that. But what was seen here in this particular study in 2010 published in Nature? So first of all, you would not have picked this as a target. It's not an enzyme. It doesn't do anything that researchers knew. But they found drugs through screening that bound to this glycoprotein. And in vitro led to profound suppression of replication. What the study from Nature showed was that a single dose led to a four log decline very rapidly. And that decline continued for about a week. Now, they also found that replication emerged actually even with a single dose. This is not a highly conserved region of the virus because it's not an enzyme, you're not targeting active site. So very potent activity. And this is where modeling comes in. You see that the mechanism of this was actually elucidated by modeling and then proven in the cell culture system. So this rapid drop that occurs within hours of swallowing NS5A inhibitor actually is blocking the assembly and release of preformed virions. Now, the modeling suggested that. Alan Perlson and others conducted modeling that showed that the only way to explain this rapid decline was not through inhibiting viral RNA synthesis. There is a second function where it blocks the formation of the membranous web that houses this replication complex. So it interacts with NS5B as well as the host. So a, a model system that we didn't actually know how the drug worked, it's now the backbone of all therapies. Now this led to the very first trial in 2011 that combined these drugs. Decladisvir, an NS5A inhibitor, plus asunapavir was the very first report of a cure with all oral therapy. What the slide depicts is the patients coming up is viral resistance. It didn't work all that well. In fact, only two of 11 patients with genotype 1A achieved what we now call cure. The rest of them experienced viral relapse. There's also some backdrop to this study that's worth mentioning. How did the investigators working under BMS get to do this trial where they combined an experimental NS5A inhibitor and experimental protease inhibitor? Well, it started in New Zealand. The very first place we saw oral therapies developed as in testing these new paradigms was not in the United States, was not in Europe, but New Zealand where sofosbuvir, which I'll get to in a minute, was initially studied as a monotherapy. And not just for three days, as the FDA required, but actually for up to 12 weeks. This nucleotide analog inhibitor, actually when combined with one of the older drugs, ribavirin, led to eradication. It also led to the recognition when this data was presented at the liver meeting, the American Association of Study of Liver, a bit of an embarrassment that by breaking the paradigm and doing something that didn't look like a good idea in a small regulatory environment like New Zealand, you could actually push the envelope forward. And that permitted this study to go forward. Now, in hindsight, this was a poor combination. In fact, this combination will never be approved in the U.S. It is approved in Japan for 1B infection. But it did allow this to go forward all because a panel of regulators, five individuals in New Zealand, decided that monotherapy more than uh, three days and a test of combination therapy might make sense.
I'll go through a couple other targets. There are non-nucleoside polymerase inhibitors that can bind to the uh, active, uh, the non-active sites of the polymerase. These are pretty weak drugs. They only inhibit the virus by about one log, and in fact, you wouldn't expect them to work very well. But that, that led to a trial where you said, okay, well, if NS5A didn't work, what about NS3 plus the non-nuke? Now, the other thing I'll point out, these are very small studies, but this one published in Control of Medicine, small groups of patients showed you could cure patients with the addition of these extra drugs, <clears throat> and that led to a phase <coughs> two trial uh, that looked at various combinations. <clears throat> so this is now in patients, 80 patients per group. And <clears throat> essentially says, what if you don't give the NS5A? That's the first group. You get an SVR or cure rate of 83%. The next one says, okay, what if you don't give that weak non-nuke? 89%. What if you hold back ribavirin? 89%. What if you put all three together? NS5A inhibitor, protease inhibitor, as well as the non-nuclear inhibitor, and throw in ribavirin, 96%. That's in 80 patients. That's precisely what was seen in clinical trials. In the clinical trial of phase threes, that's exactly what was delivered with this regimen, is 96% with a 1.2% failure. It also raises a point about the drug ribavirin. We don't really know how it works. To this day, for many patients with hepatitis C, we still use a drug where its mechanism of action is unclear. But what it appears to do is prevent the emergence of resistance. And I show you a couple slides here. This is not an antiviral in the classic sense. When you give it to the monotherapy, there's no decline in viral load, which is interesting to think about. If you use the paradigm I just outlined, you would throw ribavirin out because when you give it, it doesn't do anything as a monotherapy. So you would toss it on the trash heap. But instead, it was developed with interferon it, way back in the 1990s. And in hindsight, why? It didn't work. But it did work and it prevented viral relapse and viral emergence. And in the telapavir studies, the very first protease inhibitor, if you did not give ribavirin, the resistance rate or breakthrough rate was 24%. If you gave it, it fell to 1%. But keep in mind that if you followed this classic drug paradigm, you would have tossed it because it's not a classic antiviral. And to this day, although we wave our hands and talk about how it works, we really don't know. So what was the big breakthrough, or the one that people talk about? It was sofosbuvir, this nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor. <clears throat> Over to the right is the study done in New Zealand, published in 2010. These patient groups are 10 patients. And what you can see, including monotherapy for 12 weeks. Now keep in mind, the FDA said monotherapy for three days. New Zealand said, ah, 12 weeks, that's fine. Go ahead and give 12 weeks. Now why did they do that? Well, because this is a a very highly conserved site in the virus. And in vitro, when you expose the replicon, you didn't see resistance emerge. Very rarely you saw a mutation at position 282, but that was an unfit virus. So they then added one of the old drugs, ribavirin, as well as interferon. And they showed you could actually cure patients with only 12 weeks of therapy. So breaking the paradigm of 24, 48 weeks of treatment. Now, nucleotide analog polymerase development has been a bit arduous. So Fosfavir is the only nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor for hepatitis C that's been developed. Its commercial success has been highly documented, although somewhat disputed with uh, patent cases under that structure I showed you. There is another nucleotide that's now entered phase two that now Merck has, which is shown there. But it's also important to keep in mind that in this rush to get new hepatitis C drugs, there was an unfortunate experience. BMS acquired a company called Inhibitex. They gave this guanosine nucleotide polymerase inhibitor to patients. They rushed from phase one studies into phase two. These patients developed cardiac dysfunction. So that graph doesn't show you antiviral effect. It shows you a decline in G an estimated ejection fraction. So these patients developed serious cardiotoxicity because of the rush to try to get into phase two or three. So there is a cautionary tale, particularly when using drugs for which there may be toxicity. This is thought to be a heretofore 
uh, rarely described mitochondrial toxicity, not the classic type of toxicity that had been observed, but it does show you one of the harms of rushing forward. That said, the use of a NS5B and a NS5A inhibitor, so if you take that rapid suppression plus the durable suppression of a nuke, you might have the ideal regimen. And in fact, what ledipasvir, a NS5A inhibitor from Gilead, plus sofosbuvir is a single tablet shows over to your right, is that eight weeks, 12 weeks, or 24 weeks, with or without ribavirin, led to high cure rates. So now the paradigm is completely broken. You have eight or 12 weeks for genotype one, and the first study to let that go forward was actually a study with the cladosphere, the very first NS5A, that showed this rapid suppression and rapid cure. This was really the first time that it became clearly obvious we could cure hepatitis C. Now, these regimens were highly effective for genotype one, but the goal was to have regimens that could cure 95%. You could treat patients that didn't respond and was active against all genotypes. I know you'll spend time this uh, next few days talking about diagnosis and testing. Well, the idea of measuring the virus, sequencing the virus, or identifying the genotype in many parts of the world, it's really far-fetched. We don't have the technology or the ability to cheaply and efficiently measure a genotype. Now, if you take India, where the prevalence of hepatitis C is quite high, they've got genotype 3, 70%, and genotype 1. Well, how do you know what regimen you're picking? That regimen I showed you with ledipasvir sofosvir is not a great genotype 3 regimen. So wouldn't it be better to skip the diagnostics and have a regimen that actually works against all genotypes? Or you could develop point-of-care diagnostic testing. The problem is that creates a challenge to that care continuum that I mentioned. You want to be able to test, identify virus, and then treat. You want it to be once daily, although I will point out there is an effort to develop <clears throat> long-acting injectable nanoformulations. That MIR-122 inhibitor I mentioned is an anti-sense compound. It's being developed by the folks at GSK. Well, that, that drug is a regulus drug, but along with the NS5A from GSK is a nanoformulation. One injection perhaps can cure hepatitis C. Remains to be seen. So you want to be able to treat short, a single tablet preferably, once daily against all genotypes. And this represents the next regimen we see approved in the United States. So Fosbuvir, the nucleotide analog, plus a next generation NS5A inhibitor, Valpatisvir. These studies, known as the Astral studies, were published in New England Journal of Medicine within the last year, actually December 31st, 2015. What it shows is genotype 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 12 weeks, one pill once a day, 98% response rates, 95% in genotype 3, that may represent the harder to treat strain where some work is still being done. But one pill, once a day, all the strains identified across the, the uh, world with 95% SVR. <clears throat> this is what gives rise to talks about elimination. Now you don't have to test for the genotype, you don't have to identify much, and the drug was very well tolerated. In the Astro 1 study, there was comparison to placebo, Fatigue, nausea, headache were seen in both groups at a similar incidence. In other words, the side effect profile when dosed for 12 weeks was similar to placebo. This is not yet approved, but there's already been a generic manufacturing license signed with some of the Indian manufacturers. This is what gives rise to talk about elimination. So to summarize what I touched on is you've seen this translation from in vitro models you see the virus and the potential inhibitors in the hepatocyte to the left, and then you see a summary. Someone took all the studies of New England Journal of Medicine, and many of my colleagues feel that New England Journal of Medicine has been a hepatitis C format for the last couple of years because they keep publishing these papers. And if you take all those papers and you add up the number of patients cured, it was 96%. And that's exactly what we're now seeing. This has led to the excitement of the idea you can control and eliminate hepatitis C and their programs underway in places like Georgia, Iceland, and Australia. I think Iceland will be the first to eliminate hepatitis C. It's a small country, it's an island. They, they have things well underway. But it also highlights the challenges. 
These drugs are really not the answer. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. I mentioned earlier that we actually have more new cases in the U.S. than we had 10 years ago. We still have yet to diagnose most patients in the world, let alone the U.S., and then we haven't figured out how to link them to care and pay for that. So although generic drugs will be cheaper, they'll only be cheaper for certain countries, not for developed countries, and we haven't quite figured out how to make that commitment. So I don't want to suggest that hepatitis C is, the problem is solved because it's not. That said, if you were developing a new drug today for hepatitis C, you would think twice and you'd probably kill it because unless it has some advantage over what's already been developed, it doesn't have much of a niche. So we're not seeing many phase one and two drugs coming forward. We're seeing people tweaking the, the, the regimens, trying to get some treatments for those who fail, but we're not seeing new development. So one phase has finished, that's the drug development, but what we haven't done yet is fix the care continuum. So with that, I'll stop. I want to thank my colleagues at Johns Hopkins. That's our viral hepatitis group along the bottom. And uh, we're trying to eliminate hepatitis C in Baltimore, but we got our work cut out for us.